Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT Show. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Oh, by the way, we have almost completed 80 shows. How about that? Now, normally I introduce our guest a little bit later, and I'm still going to do that, but I need to put in a, a few words of explanation. Ruth Wishart tonight has a dreadful cold, and it's to her enormous credit that she's prepared to do the show tonight, and we're extremely grateful. Uh, but if she has to uh, duck out at some stage, I hope you'll understand why, uh, because she's really fighting the most en enormous cold. And as I said, we're terribly grateful. You know, it's been another great day for British democracy. Keir Starmer today arguably read the longest suicide note in Scottish history at the Labour Party conference. Uh, he told us he was fully signed up for Brexit, while foisting Gordon Brown on the country to preserve the union. Well, good luck with that. Thanks for joining us this evening. As I said, tonight we are talking to celebrated columnist Ruth Wishart. We'll be discussing the movers and the shakers on the political scene and so much more besides. TNT, as you know, stands for The Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. We're live and we're free. So no license, no problem. Now to our guest. Tonight, the nation talks to Ruth Wishart. How are you, Ruth? How are you coping with the cold there? Well, to be honest, John, it's not actually a, a, a full-blown cold. It's full-blown hay fever, which I to which I'm a martyr, as they say. So um, uh, if, I, if I leave, it won't be because I'm bored. It'll be because I need to sneeze again. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. We appreciate that. Um, we've had one or two questions already, and I'll come to those in a second, if I may. But uh, tell us a little bit about yourself that folks might not know. Uh, and, and maybe you could tell us how you decided to enter a career in journalism. What was it that impelled you in that direction? Well, it was a kind of, uh, I was impelled in reverse, if you like, because when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a vet. And then it became obvious in my teens that two things were going to stand in my way. The first one, was the fact that I was colossally innumerate. So it took me forever to pass a maths exam. So that was not a good start. But um, more importantly, it turned out that I couldn't stand the sight of a sick animal and still can't. I mean, I'm I'm the only person you know who has to switch off David Attenborough after 30 seconds because there's always something being turtled in the, in the first five minutes. So I'm absolutely hopeless with sick animals, which is why, although I love animals, I, I would be hopeless also at looking after them. Do it. As a vet, don't you have to? I mean, I understand it's a long qualifying process. I think you get you have to get a first degree, then later degrees, and all sorts of stuff before you can actually practice. But then you're dealing with a whole. It's not like human beings where you've got sort of one particular type of um, human being. I mean, they may be tall, maybe short, maybe thin, maybe otherwise. Yeah. But but you could be dealing with dogs one day, perhaps, and horses the next. Yeah, and the and, and and the one thing they do have in common is that they can't tell you what's wrong. <laughs> but they can react. I mean, I've got a friend who's a vet, and he went out one darkest stormy night to tend to this poor horse that was in, in terrible, terrible trouble. And uh, he said to the farmhand uh, in lamplight, you'll need to hold its head steady while I'm at the other end <laughs> doing what I need to do. <laughs> and the guy got distracted and... <laughs> And the horse laid down on top of my friend. <laughs> and he but said, he didn't get Exactly. He said, I mean, How do you shift a horse? <laughs> ah, maybe you were actually saved there, Ruth. Maybe, maybe, you can, maybe it's best to watch the animals from a distance rather than get hands on, as they say. Possibly. So, my, uh, my late brother, who was a bit older than me, went into journalism um, because neither of, neither of us fancied being what my father was, which was an accountant. And as I say, I missed the, the numeracy gene anyway, so that wasn't an option. But um, my brother uh, went off to work in, uh, in, in the southwest of, of England and he seemed to be having a pretty good time. So I started writing to every local paper in Scotland 
And I think I got a dizzy from just about all of them. I think I might still have a tin with the rejection letters in it. And nearly all of them said, well, we might want to employ you, but we can't employ you until you get some experience. And I've never managed to figure this one out. I mean, how do you get experience if nobody employ you in the first place? Anyway, eventually I got the choice between um, working for the Daily Record or working for the Falkirk Herald. And the Daily Record job was in Glasgow and the Falkirk Herald job obviously wasn't. So that kind of swung it. And of course, I had a really, really important job with the record. I was typing out the television pages. The television pages? That's what I did, yes. I, I typed out, you know, 7.30 panorama, 8 o'clock, whatever, whatever. It was it was pretty glamorous, I can tell you. <laughs> well, we're talking about uh, rejections, I, I'm reading, I, I, one of my favourite books is called like, A Confederacy of Dunces. Uh, I think it's also Billy Connolly's favourite book, uh, and I just love it. But it was written by a guy who tried in vain to get it published. And... Uh, and eventually gave up and died. And his mother, bless her cotton socks, trailed the faded manuscript around publisher after publisher, being rejected at every turn until she sent it to a professor at some literary college in the States. And he was fully prepared to cast it aside after a perfunctory, uh, yes, I'll take a look at it. And he said he only got through three paragraphs and realised this guy was a genius. Uh, and uh, and the, the book was eventually published, uh, and it's it, you know it's it's one of these remarkable things. You see, how come nobody else noticed this? Because you know it's it's phenomenal. It's fantastic writing. It's very witty, uh, and long before the sort of um, comic writers that we are familiar with today uh, uh, appeared on the scene. And so, and I think also, I mean, I think almost every author has a pile of rejection slips somewhere. I think it's probably worth noting that Douglas Stewart, who won the Booker Prize last year with uh, Shuggy Bain, he got um, ubiquitous denials of, of uh, from publishers all up and down the land, and it was eventually an, uh, an American publishing house, uh, Atlantic Grove, who, who got Shuggy Bain on its way, and I think it's now been translated into some like 30 languages, which is no mean feat when it's in Glaswegian. But, um, it's extraordinary. He's done, he's done pretty well out of it for a man who had a suitcase full of rejection letters. <laughs> so, despite the fact you got rejected, you eventually got a job, you started off with the television guide, and then what happened? How did you manage to... Well, I mean, I was working on a, uh, I was working on a features desk, uh, that was, um, and the features desk had some... I mean, these were the days where they had... Um, you know, it was a, an extraordinary um, learning curve for somebody like me because they had a full-time education correspondent, a full-time crime correspondent, a full-time, um, uh, you know, they had an investigative journalist in the shape of, of Paul Foote, you know, who went on, as we know, to be a hugely respected and award-winning investigative journalist uh, elsewhere. And um, um, Mike Grieve, Christopher uh, Christopher Grieve's son, uh, Hugh McDermott's son, he was he was there writing as well. So it was there was you know there was some spectacularly good talent there, and um, I was just lucky that eventually they let me write a feature, and then I, I kind of got the hang of it. <laughs> did you get any sort of feedback when you did your first feature? I mean, no, nope, nothing whatsoever. No, nope. I used to, later on in life when I was in in other newspapers doing other things, I used to get lots of what we used to call green ink letters, you know, from. Uh, but but you know that it's the opposite of in these days in Twitter. If somebody says something really vile about you, you just block them. In these days, you just tore it up and put it in the bin. That's the same effect. <laughs> yes, uh, I interviewed uh, Hugo Rifkin a couple of three weeks ago. Uh, and uh, he, he does this column for the Times, and uh, and you know he, I mean he he tends to put aside a bunch of time in order to do it. But of course, because it has to be topical, you, you can't do it too far in advance. So you're you're caught in this vice where you would like to spend more time thinking about it, maybe, uh, but you've got a deadline, uh, and you have to you have to get on with it and get it done. Uh, Leaving that aside, when you look at the media nowadays that we have compared to the media that you began with, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, one of the most depressing things for me, apart from the fact that, of course, that the staffing levels have been decimated in, in almost every Scottish newspaper uh, over the years. I remember once um, 
wanting to uh, change something in a column that I was writing and uh, phoning up a friend in the on the on the desk and saying, "Have you got a, a spare computer?" And he said, "Take your pick." And you know, it was like the Marie Celeste in there. So there's been huge staffing cuts because I used to um, know a guy called Charlie. Well, I still do know a guy called Charlie Wilson, who was the um, founding editor of the Sunday Standard and then became the editor of the Times in London. And Charlie said there was only three things that sold newspapers. That was content, content and content. So if you keep cutting content and you keep cutting the people who provide content, then, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a mugs game. It's a zero sum game. You're bound to lose readers because why would they buy something if they don't? I mean, I, I, I've always read newspapers for other columnists and I'm, I suspect quite a lot of other people do too I wonder if it's a sort of almost a self uh, creating circumstance where you, you do a few cuts and then the, maybe the quality level goes down and you have to cut a little bit more and you cut a little bit more and, uh, and eventually that, you know, that, I'm sorry, John, but that would be true. That would only be true if people weren't still making profits out of. Uh, I think a, a, a more accurate reflection of what's happened is that people got greedy in terms of making squeezing more money out of newspapers. I, I tell you what, a lot of people uh, who watch this show tell me, and people who are on it too, who are not journalists, uh, they, they claim that uh, so much of journalism nowadays is tabloid, even the broadsheets. Uh, are tempted down the tabloid route. If it bleeds, it leads. Uh, and that content that you talked about seems to be diminishing and the tabloid side of it seems to be augmented somehow. That's their impression. Well, I, think, think? I, think, I think they're right in, in one respect. I mean, there are newspapers, but well, for instance, when I um, when I started in journalism, the Daily Telegraph, which of which I'm not a particular fan, you'll not be surprised to learn. But the Daily Telegraph was uh, um, was always admired for its for the for its news coverage because it was a, it had a very good staff, especially a very good foreign staff, and it always um, it always was admired for the way it, it, it presented its news coverage. However. Over the years, um, the demarcation lines between news and opinion has gradually um, has gradually been erased, and so you get quite a lot of stuff now on news pages, in papers like that, where both the headline and the news story have got an opinionated slant within them, and I think that's really ba very bad journalism, and very bad for journalism. So why do people do it? Well, I mean, that, the proprietors, that's what, I mean, I guess in the case of something like the Telegraph, it probably sells newspapers, though, like most newspapers, they're preaching to the converted. I mean, the paper that you and I both write for probably preaches to quite a lot of the converted as well. Yeah, I'm sure it, it does. I mean, uh, on this show, we, I, I try to be as different as we can. We go outside the so-called constitutional silos whenever we can. I mean, Hugo Rifkin couldn't be described as an uh, independent supporter and uh, neither could a whole bunch of others, Kenny Farkerson and others. So we, we do try and, and be as eclectic as we possibly can and as universal as we, we, we can. The, the, the difficulty, the challenge with is getting people to come on the show uh, who espouse a different view on the Constitution. Uh, the people I've mentioned were more than happy uh, and others, but heavens, you know, I, I've written to almost every single right of centre journalist in Scotland and, and, and many don't even uh, do the courtesy of a reply uh, and I'm thinking well I just can't see the logic of that I mean this isn't 60 minutes where you get a chance to put your point of view um, there's no way I would try and intrude on that That's it's important that people get uh, you know a, a broad understanding of how people whose views they don't agree with uh, how they feel about things it's, I mean if you're looking to create an independent state you surely must be worried about or concerned about the views of people who don't necessarily take that view right now, but may have to live in that state. And so for me, it just makes so much sense. But I'd like to take a few questions, if I may. Mike Fennick is asking, uh, what are Ruth's thoughts on the jailing of Craig Murray? Well, I mean, I've got, um, like, like most of these things, it's not completely black and white because I think I think uh, Craig Murray, who's not a journalist, he was, a, a, as we know, um, at one time a, a distinguished ambassador and uh, did a fine job of explaining um, the finer points of torture in, in some of the stands. But, um, and, so I, and, and I do think his, I think he, he 
either misread or didn't understand the laws containing uh, the, the instructions containing the the um, identification or the or the possible identification of the people in the salmon trial. Having said that, I don't think anything's served by putting a man of his age and um, health in jail. In fact, you know, I, I just don't think it's I don't, I don't think jailing him made any sense at all. I think another sanction ought to have been found. I, I didn't understand it for a whole raft of reasons. Um, even looking at it very cynically, um, you, you could argue that it's counterproductive. You know, e e e even if the aim was to suppress his viewpoint, making a martyr of somebody is the least effective way of doing that, I should have thought. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not a politician, so I, <laughs> I just look at it from an ethical point of view. And, and the way you look at it, too, seems to me to be a viewpoint that will probably be shared by lots of people. Um, um, Stephen Kelly is asking, surely we need independence, Ruth, by next spring or summer when COVID levels ought to be extremely low. What's your thinking on that? Well, I don't think there's any chance of getting independence by spring or ne uh, next spring or summer, but I certainly think we ought to be banging the drum next spring um, and getting getting the independence show on the road. I mean, I'm, I'm amongst the, um, the people who are, are pretty impatient about this, be partly because... Um, Partly because I thought that the the, uh, the Brexit situation, um, as is now being proved, was a, was a, a clarion call to everybody to recognise that we could do better as a as a small independent uh, nation state attached to Europe. I, because I am a European as well as an internationalist, um, so I would certainly like the, the, to get the ball rolling. I have a feeling um, I have a feeling that uh, Mike Russell might be on the road to doing just that at the start of next year. So I'm I'm looking out for that, but. Um, I think realistically, I mean, what, what interested me about the last independence campaign, apart from the fact that I enjoyed it thoroughly, I, I really I don't recognise this portrait of it as a as a horrible divisive um, um, process which which divided families. That that wasn't my experience of it at all. Um, but if we want to engender the same kind of change we got in 2014, which was moving the the dial on on uh, towards the yes vote quite remarkably but we had if we remember you know we we had quite a number of years to do that and i think if we want to make sure that we get the kind of victory that can't be questioned then we have to have a a, a reasonably lengthy campaign so i would like to get started as early as possible um next year and then i would like to have a full-throated campaign that perhaps lasts a year or 18 months so in order to get there westminster has to agree upon a referendum well no i, I I don't, I don't, I don't accept that. You see, this is a, this is a, this is something that is, is a, a mantra that everybody repeats. That you know, it's, it's, it's a constitutionally only Westminster can give permission for um, a courts gold standard referendum. But I mean, that that's that proposition has never really been tested in the courts. So, I, you know, I would like um, if 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 there is another question, um, if Boris Johnson says no yet again to a section thirty. I don't see any reason why we why we can't see well. I remember the late great um, Canon Kenyon Wright said um, mm -hmm. when asked the same question about Margaret Thatcher, and and somebody said, but 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 Kenyon, what happens if um, Margaret Thatcher says no? And he said, well, we we we're the people, and we say yes, and that's my view about this as well. We ought to we ought to test it in the courts, and we ought to we ought to go for it. Um, but I, I guess though a lot of people are thinking about. Uh, the position that Nicola Sturgeon takes. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, because I've interviewed him quite recently, Mike Russell, which is, we have to wait until COVID is over, uh, and then we're going to ask uh, for a Section 30. And that, that's not me saying that, that's them saying that. They, they appear to have concluded that there is only the gold standard and no other way. Well, I, mean, I know that 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 that's the view, and and I also understand. I mean, I really do understand um, the hesitation over the COVID situation because the COVID uh, situation and the pandemic has been absolutely horrendous for everybody. So, um, it would have been a, 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 a dereliction of duty if she hadn't tackled it. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze again. Feel free. <laughs> Sorry about that. It would have been a dereliction. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry about this, but I can't do anything about it. It would have been a dereliction of duty if, if Nicola Sturgeon hadn't stepped up to that particular plate and, and she, she did an outstanding job, in my view. In, 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 uh, I, I know that we made mistakes, um, as they, they did indeed in London, but I don't think there was anything like, I, I don't think there was any of the kind of um, 
uh, naked corruption over the acquisition of PPE that we saw from some UK government minister. So on that, in the, in the sense that the pandemic is still lingering, I, I can see the need for caution. And I can also see um, the difficulty that a Scottish First Minister has, who is at the moment dependent on the goodwill of London, the goodwill of Westminster for all kinds of things, um, all kinds of, um, you know, it, it, picking fights with the Westminster won't get us um, won't get us very far. On the other hand, um, I am of the view that if we don't now take this particular bull by the horns, then we're losing the opportunity to harvest the goodwill of lots of people who will just not go out again and well, they don't want to knock on doors these days anyway, but I mean, the, the the momentum that has been built up won't be built up if we if we antagonise or disenfranchise our core support. I understand the need to win over the waverers. That's absolutely vital. Of course it is. But let's not let's not forget that we've got a lot of people who've put in a lot of a lot of their life and a lot of their hours trying to get us this far. And they have to be respected, too. I think that's a very good point. And, uh, you know, one respects the view that you would, you don't want to ask people to go to polls and you don't want that to listen to um, you know referendum speeches necessarily when there's a, a pandemic raging. Uh, but on the other hand, the Westminster government has during that time has formed a union unit. It has staffed it. Uh, I think we are all paying for it. Uh, it has made itself. It's indulged in what it calls itself muscular unionism which now appears to have been uh, discounted. Uh, but uh, for a time, it was very muscular. And most of the representatives in Scotland seem to be intent on uh, just a campaign of negativity. Now, I don't think that has any appeal to that middle group that you mentioned at all. I don't think being negative appeals to people who are swithering. Uh, but it does appeal to the base, which leaves the impression that they've rather given up on things and they're busy trying to hold the base together, um, which does respond to negative uh, material, uh, continuous negative material. But it does mean that the, the, the rest of that space is now open uh, for, for reaching out to these folks in the middle. Uh, with, with It may not be a campaign. It may be simply, here are the facts, here are the figures, uh, because there's still so much nonsense talk. So you must be aware of this. You must watch interviews and think, you know, where did this come from? What are they on? Yeah. Well, I tell you, um, I, I don't know um, how um, across everybody is with the with the belief in Scotland literature, but um, I signed up for that, and um, I mean that's the kind of thing that we have to distribute because that's um, it's positivity on stilts. It's talking about what Scotland can do. It's talking about the sectors that are working. It's talking about where we are ahead in innovation and all these other things, and and. I, I have no doubt in my mind that um, we will have a tough time um, after independence because, you know, th there will be all kinds of challenges and there will be all kinds of financial um, problems. I have no doubt about that whatsoever, but I've also got no doubt whatsoever that a few years down the road, we can be a thriving small European country with a much better sense of ethics and social justice than is evidenced from what we're under from Westminster at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Uh I'd like to take another question, if I may. Uh, and it's a very straightforward one. Uh, Jane Cooper Stewart is asking, Ruth, do you think it's acceptable to wait until 2023 to have a referendum? And I guess your well, answer is no. <laughs> well, uh, well, yes, no, my answer is yes, because uh, not because I, I think we should hang around forever. I, I made it quite clear that, that my own impatience with all of this, but I think if, if you remember, I said a minute ago that what we need to do is give ourselves a chance to build momentum. So if we start campaigning early, early 2022 and have a referendum in 2023, I think that gives us a reasonable amount of time to get a act together because there's a whole lot of things. You know, we all know that when, you know, when the starting gun goes and before, as you said yourself, the union unit is already pumping out stuff, you know, all kinds of disinformation and, and scare stories. But we have to we have to be on the ball as well, and we all know that when the starting gun is fired, we're going to get lots of questions about borders, about Scottish currency, about all manner of things, and and the groundwork has to be in place. The answers have to be formulated, and we have, we all have to have a proper hymn sheet to read off at that time, and that's going to take some more work. That I mean, a lot of people have done a lot of hard work on this already, but sadly, not very many of them are in the government. 
that, that many people would find that comment disconcerting because they may be thinking to themselves, we, we elected a Scottish National Party whose primary objective hasn't yet been addressed. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I understand where you're coming from with that, but I mean, I think, I think that. Um, I think a window of opportunity was missed um, pre-pandemic and post-Brexit. I think after Scotland voted so overwhelmingly against Brexit for Europe and before the pandemic, I, I mean, because the, the Brexit referendum, if you remember, was 2016, the pandemic really only got underway in early 2020. So there was, in my view, a time then where we could have done more than we did in terms of progressing the independence argument. So I think that was a bit of a lost opportunity. But... We are where we are, so um, I repeat, I think we need to give ourselves a year at least to mount uh, an all-singing, all-dancing campaign with all the facts at our fingertips. There's a point that's often raised with me uh, on these programmes, uh, and that is that that time that could have been spent, as you suggested, fruitfully looking at the independence question and doing some of the necessary homework, seems to have been spent worrying about gender issues. Is that your impression too? No, I don't think that time then was spent worrying about gender issues. But I mean, it's no secret that that's a, a fissure in, in, the, in the independence movement at the moment. And I've nailed my particular colours to the mast. And I have to say that I got dogs abuse for it. But, you know, I'm a big girl and I can take that. Why did you get dogs abuse? Because um, anybody, any, any woman uh, who stands up and says, look, you know, um, you can't buck biology, you can't buck science, you know, and and I have every respect for people who decide on a different gender from the one they were assigned, but that's quite different from their biological sex, in my view. And, you know, we've, we've been through a period where there was a, a, there's been a row in the last few weeks about a, a piece in The Lancet, which said, which talked about women, um, they put it on its front page, obviously, in order to be provocative, but it talked about um, bodies with cervixes. Now, I mean, come on, I'm, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age, and, you know, I'm more than a body with a cervix, I do assure you. <laughs> okay, moving on, as they say. Margaret McGovern <coughs> asks, uh, do you think that independence and joining the EU should be linked uh, and surely then we could vote for independence first uh, and then decide if we want to join the EU or EFTA, uh, two different votes. What do you think of that? Should it be just clear cut or should there be some sort of coordinated corresponding vote? I, ab I absolutely, do <laughs> absolutely don't think we want a referendum on top of a referendum, that's for sure. Um, we've been down that road twice, um, uh, once with Brexit and once with uh, in 2014. And, you know, it... I think we've learned a few lessons about referenda there. I do absolutely respect people who um, who are for independence but not pro pro Europe, and I absolutely respect people who would prefer to be in EFTA rather than the EU. And I think you know, let a thousand flowers bloom in that argument. However, I personally am a committed European, I'm, and and as a committed European, I really honestly believe that it, as I thought it was madness for. Uh, um, the UK to detach itself from this huge market on our doorstep. I also think it would be utter madness for Scotland to do so. Yes, yeah. I, I think a lot of people would probably agree with that. I, <laughs> here's, a, here's a question about the monarchy. Could I, could I just make one point, just going back, I don't want to go back to the, the, the gender reassignment argument because uh, gender um, because, because, you know, it's it's toxic, the whole debate's toxic. But could I just make the point that I, I didn't get around to making, which is once I stated my viewpoint, and anybody who states a viewpoint about this, um, just defending basic science, is immediately called transphobic. And, you know, it's really, really frustrating for people like me who marched up and down the land in when, they, when their knees would take it, and who marched up and down the land um, in defence of minority rights, suddenly to be called transphobic. I'm not anything phobic, except with the possible exception of um, the English football team when we're playing them. <laughs> well, uh, maybe moving from the, uh, the fire into the frying pan here, uh, what about the monarchy? I mean, one of the questions, I'm part of a group that designs constitutions and we would very much like for there to be a, a written constitution for Scotland, uh, at least in 
interim or draft form before there's any referendum, so people know what sort of state they're going to uh, uh, suddenly emerge after independence. Uh, and one of the questions that crops up the whole time is, who is the head of state going to be? What's your opinion? Should I've the Queen... very, very simple one sentence answer to that. I'm a Republican. Good. So your, your view is that the people should elect the head of state like they do in Ireland, for example. Yeah, well, I mean, Ireland's quite a good case in point because, you know, the, the, the heads of state they've had, I mean, I had the great privilege of chairing a, an Edinburgh Book Festival session with um, the sainted Mary Robinson a couple of years back when we could still gather in, in, in tents in Edinburgh. And um, she was, uh, I think, um, an example of if, if you get a, a really intelligent, committed person as your first head of state, that makes a huge difference to the argument. I also think the monarchy is a busted flush. I mean, really, I mean, the, the whole Prince Andrew thing is just beyond the pale. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure it's recoverable, frankly. Um, and also the, the enthusiasm for the monarchy tends to taper off as you move from the south of this island to the north. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes it tapers off quite significantly if things come. I think I think you know an, an obvious an obvious um, point would be um, um, the, the 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 current queen enjoys huge support as we know um, a, a, you know in every poll that's taken about it. So I mean, but she is a, a very elderly lady and she won't won't be around forever. And and when she um, you know when she uh, falls off her gilded perch, I think that's as good a moment as any to to draw a line under the monarchy. Yeah, yeah, I think I think Charles would have difficulty, and also feel that um, the empathy towards the Queen might be, to some degree, maybe a large degree, based on people of a certain age who grew up with that sort of notion that there had to be somebody who wasn't a politician, uh, and therefore was probably more trustworthy. Who knows? Uh, which is something that older people say to me all the time. But oh, politicians are all. Pretty dreadful, but the we don't have to. We don't have to have a politician as a head of state, you know. Precisely. Who would you fancy to be the first head of state of an independent Scotland? Certainly not. Too old and too Republican. <laughs> no, but who would you fancy? If you I, don't want to have, I, I don't actually have any thoughts about that. I mean, I haven't got that far, but but I'm I've got great faith in in the Scottish people. I mean, I I know. In another incarnation, I'm just about to demit office as chair of the Dewar Arts Awards, and the Dewar Arts Awards are all about giving young people a chance who want to do some, who are really talented in, in the arts, but who don't have very much money. And, um, you know, the one thing I've learned over the years that I've been involved with this is that there is t talent everywhere, and it's untapped largely. And yeah. There's talent everywhere in terms of... Um, people who make a real civic contribution to Scotland. And I have every faith in the fact that Scotland can find itself a, a really fine head of state. And I would personally prefer it not to be a politician of any stripe. You think it ought to be a woman? Well, obviously. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you to put a name in the, in the, in the hat, but not I don't, in the I don't, I don't, No, but I mean, if, if we got to the stage where this became a, a, a fact of life, that we were going to elect a, a, a head of state, then that's yeah. that's the moment when we will find um, people coming out of the woodwork, and that's the moment when people will be nominated, and that's the moment where we'll find a cast list that we didn't know we had. <laughs> it would be a plum job, wouldn't it, to be the first president? I don't think so. I think it would be. I mean, think of all the Scottish football matches you need to go to where we lose. <laughs> Yeah, but you could go to the women's football matches where we don't lose so consistently. Oh, yes, there is that. Yes, yes, and they're, they're great. <laughs> but anyway, but seriously, I think I think there's every chance that if um, there's every chance that if we get to the stage we're going to elect a head of state, that we will have a uh, a list of people that of whom we could be proud. Yeah, I'm sure that's going to be the case, and it certainly was the case in Ireland, wasn't it? Yes, I think, I think I mean, and the present incumbent is is a. Uh, strikes me as somebody who's got their foot, feet on the ground and, and really knows what he's talking about and is articulate too. Absolutely. Uh, very impressive man. Uh, Duncan Barron is asking your views on JERS, not the football team, but the, uh, but the economic uh, uh, indicator. Uh, and he claims that it was the biggest reason people voted no in 2014, uh, and it, it, the question is, why, why do you think the SNP uh, consistently peddle JERS and use it as an indicator when most people in the business, accounting business at least, regard it as being 
misleading at best, at least. Yes, well, I mean, I, I'm I'm absolutely no economist. I think I started off this conversation by saying I was, you know, totally enumerate. But I do understand the fact that JERS is based on the situation as uh, in terms of Scotland's um, profit and loss account, in, in terms of where we are at the moment as part of our Westminster system, under which we pay for lots of things that we wouldn't be paying for were we independent. So uh, it's a, it's fictitious in as much as um, if we're talking about uh, a post-independent Scotland, then we'd be looking at an entirely different set of figures because we'd be paying for, paying for and investing in an entirely different set of things. And, and yet, when we talk on this programme to people who are either in the government or advising the government, like Andrew Wilson, they, they generally rely on the JARS numbers. Yes, well, I don't really, I don't really understand. I mean, I know Andrew Wilson quite well, and I'm happy to count him as a friend, but I don't, I don't really, I don't really think he's got it right in terms of the growth report. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suspect it's it's going through a period of. Uh, Re-evaluation. Re-evaluation, to put it gently. Yeah, I suspect that that, that may be what's happening. Um, the, we talked about the EU and, and Jim McIntyre raised a question about how do you get around the latest EU guidance on accession to membership uh, that states that uh, it would take a minimum of six years from start to finish for a country to join uh, and that there will be no special case for Scotland, he, he reckons. I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think, I mean, from all the information that I'm getting and all the information that I'm gleaning from our friends in, 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 in mainland Europe suggests to me that Scotland would be well placed to have a, a faster track entry than that, partly because um, although we wouldn't be the success, successor state um, uh, because the UK is the member and, and not Scotland, but nevertheless, we have um, been a European a European member, albeit at, at one remove, for very many years, for 40 years. So I think that gives us a bit of a head start. And the other argument that's always put up is that the, that we, we wouldn't be able to um, uh, observe the rules about having no more than a 3% uh, deficit. But I mean, if you look at the, if you look at um, the EU, I mean, even pre-pandemic, look at the EU and countries like uh, Italy and Greece and, and several others um, were nowhere near um, observing these rules. I don't see why Scotland would uniquely be penalised for, for not stepping up to that place on day one. And also there's other alternatives. You could join EFTA, you could join some of these other groups en route to full membership, perhaps. Yeah, well, I mean, as I say, I, I respect other people's views. My own personal preference is to, is to, is to um, uh, try and be readmitted to the European community. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of people miss the fact that uh, that's... that's uh, that's becoming a bigger problem every day. When you look at the, I, I, I've written a couple of books on, on business ethics and they've sold reasonably well a long time ago, perhaps. And, and that's because people back then, particularly corporations were interested in ethical issues and it moved on to being the environment uh, and, and all the rest of that good stuff and looking more green. Um, what do you think of the UK's record in terms of ethical conduct by its leaders and their contribution to the climate change debate. I think I think we've been pretty poor. Um, I mean, we, as 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 young Greta Thunberg said um, at the at the Young Activist Conference just last week, we really are very good at talking the talk and pretty hopeless at walking the walk. Um, I I think um, I've got great faith in that generation. Um, not just in terms of, of um, being active properly in climate change and putting pressure properly on governments to do better and to do better faster. But I've also got great faith in them in terms of independence. If you look at the independence stats, um, the people who support independence in the greatest numbers are that generation, are the youngsters. I mean, the, the, the naysayers are, are dying off. And one of the reasons I'm in a hurry is I'd quite like to, to happen before I'm one of them. But it's, it's my generation that are the stumbling block. If you, once you get above um, a certain age uh, group, that demographic is the last holdout against Scottish independence. Everybody else is well over 50%. And the, and the youngsters in particular are, um, you know, I think something like 70%. And so they're tomorrow's Scotland and they're the future of Scotland and they're going to get it right for us. I would probably agree with that, though I would dispute the fact that the, the, the older generation, it, 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 well, of course, they're dying off in the literal sense, but they might be being replaced by people who are risk averse, i.e. that as people get older, 
by and large, they become more risk averse. So therefore, that group amongst the over 55s is being replaced as some drop off at the other end by people who have become just risk averse as they get older. And I have to I have to say that, you know, that's another gene that I've missed out on. I get bullshit as I get older. <laughs> and I'm happy about that. Let me never be less than bullshit. But, you know, so, I mean, there's a serious point in there. I mean, I, I, I take your point, but this is, I mean, if you're uh, depending on one income, uh, say it's a pension, and somebody tells you that if you vote yes in a referendum coming up, uh, then you won't have your pension anymore. That was one of the that was one of the most appalling scare stories from the last time. Um, because I mean, a it wasn't true. It just simply wasn't true. It was a lie um, that the pensions would be put at risk. But the other thing to bear in mind is um, we have the crappiest pensions to use a to use a colloquialism in all of Europe. I mean, our pensions are appalling. So if if you say to a, a, a Scottish pensioner, look. Um, this pension that you're that you're worried about, if if you if you become um, a member of an independent nation in the European Union, your pension is in, far from being um, being wiped out is, is is likely to be doubled. I mean that's quite a powerful argument, and that's one of the things I was talking about earlier about having these facts at our fingertips. I mean, if you show anybody who's a current pensioner a, a list of the pensions in Europe, country by country by country, you can see what a shoddy uh, business our pension is. And also the other thing too, and I, I deeply regret that the Yes campaign didn't seize upon this uh, back in 2014. The, the pension, the, the, the people don't seem to understand, the pension arrangements in, in the UK are a Ponzi scheme. Uh, they're a Ponzi scheme for the simple reason that there's no pot somewhere. I mean, I spoke to pensioners on doorsteps and they said to me, there's a pot of money somewhere in London, probably the Bank of England, and that's where... That's where my pension is. So if we become independent, we won't have access to that pot of money. To which yeah. my answer was, there is no money. What? What do you mean there is no money? The money that your, your pension is being provided out of taxes paid by young people right now. So it's a Ponzi scheme. There is no money. Well, <laughs> and the people who and money... It's quite true, and it's another reason why um, uh, people of my generation shouldn't be burdening people of the next two generations, because everybody thinks that, just exactly as you said, John, everybody thinks that um, I've paid all my life into this, yeah. therefore this is this is my due now. But we haven't, we've paid all our life into paying the, the generation above us um, their pension. So as you say, I wouldn't call it, go so far as to call it a Ponzi scheme, but it's a circular tour. Yeah, uh, and the people getting paid today are, I've been paid from the money that people who think they're going to get paid later on. <laughs> yeah, and so it goes on. Yeah, if, you did that, if you did that in Wall Street, it would, it would qualify as a Ponzi scheme. Uh, but, but leaving that aside, um, there, there's a number of people, Ruth, who are, have taken to describing Scotland as a colony. What, what's your take on that? Well, I, I think I once got wrapped over the knuckles for for writing something along these lines. And we're not obviously a colony because a colony, but we are um, nevertheless. The other thing we're not is a partner, an equal partner in a in a in a union of equals or an equal partner in a voluntary union. What has happened over the years is that this voluntary partnership has now become. Um, um, a diktat from Westminster, and and we're not being treated as a as the partner that the vow promised we would be, or as Gordon Brown keeps promising we would be under some mythical federal solution. We're being treated as a vassal state, in my view. But I don't think that makes us a colony, but I think it makes us daft. Yeah, it does make us daft, and it, it, <clears throat> and it, it it makes us, in my humble opinion, it makes us look inward, um, which is I think is always a mistake when you're trying to convince people generally on that. Um, th there's a, an issue that crops up uh, fairly frequently that, uh, that, that people are, are raising tonight again. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, Maggie Fuge says, uh, please, Ruth, I hope your hay fever gets better soon. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Maggie. I've, um, I've chucked down the antihistamine and when this is finished, I'm going to chuck down a glass of the dry white. <laughs> Or, or maybe the malt, if you if you've got some of that available. Oh, strictly, a, strictly an intravenous dry white woman. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a. If somebody was to ask you, where where do you where would you see 
Scotland and the rest of the UK in five years' time? Just imagine you're looking into your teacup and you're reading the leaves there. What, 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 what does it show you? Well, I can't really answer that because I've, I've never been much good at the tea leaves. Uh, what I can, I can tell you what I'd hope would be the case in five years' time. I would hope in five years' time that Boris Johnson, in my view, one of the worst prime ministers ever to not grace number 10 down I would hope he would be history, um, both for the sake of his own party as well as for the sake of the country. I would hope Scotland would be, um, after a, a successful referendum, I would hope we would be well on our way to forging a, a, a new deal in the world. I think Scotland, as a small nation, has got a huge amount to offer. I'm inordinately proud of being Scottish, and I always have been, but not just because I happen to have been born here, but because I genuinely think that we are a, a talented, innovative nation. And I think once we get a free reign to demonstrate that, um, I'm not going to talk about global Scotland because global Britain's a bit of a joke, but <laughs> but I do think we can make a better way in the world than we're being allowed to at the moment. Oh, I wouldn't be so sure that global Britain has been a failure. We are now the world's uh, greatest it's laughing, laughing stock. stock. <laughs> so it's been a huge success from that point of view. Um, here's a question. I, I usually ask people uh, uh, right or centre who are on, but I, I'm going to ask you this question because it... it, it it interests me greatly, which is, why do you think there's no right-wing nationalist party in Scotland? Well, I, I don't know the reason why there isn't, but I can I can say that I'm profoundly grateful that there isn't. I mean, if you look at the right-wing nationalist parties um, in the world at the moment, um, uh, the AFD in Germany, um, which happily didn't do all that well in the recent election, but it's still, you know, motoring. And you look especially at, at Hungary and, um, and and Turkey and, you've, and you see right-wing nationalism in full flower in these countries. And it's always, always bad news. It's always um, the kind of nationalism that borders on xenophobia. Uh, what well, doesn't border on xenophobia is just plain mm. xenophobic, and these are not the kind of um, th that's not the kind of um, right wing nationalism to which a country like Scotland should uh, uh, aspire or to which it should give any kind of electoral sucker. So I'm very happy. I know that I do know some right wing people who are who are nationalists, but that's quite different from having a right wing nationalist party. And I think it's to our credit that our nationalism, um, which so many people don't seem to understand, not least Sir Keir Stam don't seem to understand the premise of civic nationalism, a civic nationalism that is internationalist and outlook. They don't seem to get that. And I really wish they would. Today in his speech, I uh, I heard him say that Labour is the party of the union. Now, with the best will in the world, um, I cannot see how that's going to garner him, garner him more votes in Scotland. I really don't see if, it, if he's hemorrhaged members um, to the SNP over the last few elections, which she self-evidently has, why would um, underscoring your unionist credentials bring these people back? Well, one of our guests who was on a couple of weeks ago would have given a straightforward answer to that. His name is James Hawes. He's an historian. He's written uh, a book called The Shortest History of England. And he would have said he's appealing to the, the tribe in the South. That tribe in the South uh, What's no truck with union? Uh, the people in the north of England, uh, he says, have much more in common in terms of values and, and other respects. Uh, and he says there's always been a cleave down the Trent Humber between the north and the south of England. And Labour politicians become prime ministers when they don the necessary clothing that appeals to people in the south of England. Uh, as long as they can retain a voting strength in the North to some degree. And what he's just doing exactly that, surely, he's appealing to a Southern audience. Well, I, well, if he is, he's, he's being a bit silly because it was always the case. It used to always be posited that Labour couldn't win uh, or win handsomely in 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 an election in a UK, on a UK basis unless they had a substantial support of, uh, of Scottish seats, Scottish Labour seats. Now, Keir Starmer's got one Scottish Labour seat in Westminster. That doesn't seem to me much of, uh, you know, if you've got one one Labour MP in a country where you had over 40 Labour MPs, I don't think the route back to 40-something Labour MPs is to say we're the party of the union. And if he, if he is going to just diss Scotland like that and dismiss the Scottish uh, Labour Party like that, then I think he's, he's, he's barking up several wrong trees. Well, I guess his rationale is that Scotland is lost. It's not coming back. Uh, to some degree, Wales 
uh, is not coming back either, even though they have a, a quite a fine uh, first minister. So what he has to do is to somehow appeal to the south and do what very few Labour uh, uh, heads have ever done, which is to make the Labour Party appealing to the south. And that means he has to go to the right. Uh, and he has to espouse the whole credo about I'm anti-Brexit, I'm, anti, I'm pro-Brexit, uh, I don't want any truck with unions. You know, that's... I don't, think, I don't think I don't think he said either of these things. To be fair, I think what he said was that, as far as he was concerned, Brexit was just at his news and it was dead and buried. And I think he he, he did make a point that he, he, he that his Labour Party would work both with the unions and with business. Now you can take that, uh, you know, with however much so however many pinches of salt you want to. But I don't think he would he would describe himself as anti-union. And and to be fair, I don't think I would describe him as that either. <laughs> Uh, no, I was thinking about the the the, the union of uh, in the UK. Oh, sorry, uh, I thought you meant the trade union. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I I think he has to continue, if only for financial reasons, to to cozy up to the unions. I can't see that would be a, very much a suicidal move to to to, to be anti-union. No, I was thinking he's he, the reason he espouses pro-unionism in such an unthinking way. I mean, anyone who's read his speech, it, it looks to me, but it was written by a sixth former who'd never been north of Watford. Uh, it just was a, just frankly appalling, poor, very poor stuff. But, but the other thing, John, that I, I, it strikes me about this, which I've never quite understood, all the recent polling suggests that in um, in England, I mean, there was a, a, a fascinating poll that I paid particular attention to, which said um, at the time of Brexit, it said if, if you would lose Scotland or lose Brexit, which, what, which would you rather lose? And, you know, a huge proportion of English people said they just, they'd be perfectly sanguine about losing Scotland as long as they got Brexit. Now, I mean, that was before Brexit unravelled so as spectacularly as it now, uh, it now is doing. But nevertheless, there is a, a lot of people in, in both the North and South of England who frankly don't give a toss about the Union and don't give a toss about Scotland. So, so I don't see that Keir Starmer banging the Union drum is even going to do much good in England. Well, it does a little bit. It, it protects them. Because at, at the next election, he's going to have to be talking about coalitions, I suspect, because the Conservatives will go through a very bad period because of Johnson and because of ERG. Uh, but they eventually, as Conservatives always do, they will defenestrate those groups and start to appeal to the middle, middle, uh, middle of the road again. Uh, and it will become a straight fight between Labour and Tory as to how many Lib Dems they can bring on board, perhaps, who knows. But I think what he's telling me, what I'm hearing, is he's given up on Scotland completely. That's It's gone. He's gone down a different strategy, and that strategy is to appeal to people more in the South, and that means dismissing the Scottish situation out of hand. It means saying Brexit's a done deal. There's so much he could have said, Ruth. He could have said, we're going to try and ameliorate the worst effects of, of Brexit because we're going to develop... X, Y, Z commissions, whatever. Bless you. It's okay, I'm still there. <laughs> Instead of that, he says, we're going to have a commission, but it's going to look at independence. You think, oh, come on, guy. You know, it, 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 there's the number of people in England who are fussed about that is the square root of zero again. I mean, nobody cares. Uh, I, lived, <coughs> I lived in Blackford for 20 years, and I, I never heard anyone talk about Scotland ever in any context apart from... Maybe a, well, I think a, a it's re- interesting putting Gordon Brown in charge of this. I mean, for me, in any case, any kind of um, constitutional commission, any kind of, I mean, we've been we've been round that course so often. I mean, I'm I'm, you know, federalism isn't going to happen partly because England doesn't want it, and partly because it would be profoundly asymmetric anyway. So it's it's not a runner in my book. But but in any case, you know. The long grass is already overpopulated with people who've been trying to say, well, all we need is to talk about it a bit more. Enough already. Let's get on with it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So what what do you think? If you were advising Nicola Sturgeon right now uh, and you were to say, here's a route map for the next 12 months for First Minister when it comes to independence, what, what advice would you be giving her? Well, I, I, the last person she would take advice from is me, I suspect, but or maybe the second last. Um, but anyway, I, I would, I would like to see. I would like, I would say to her, you know, we've we've got a, a, a small and closing window of opportunity here. 
So let's um, let's put our case as robustly as we can. Let's start a campaign in earnest uh, in January. Let's run it for uh, perhaps 18 months, but let's run it and run it hard. Let's do all the homework that we have to do to get the answers to the questions we know people are going to ask us. And let's just press the button and go for it. And if we get to the situation where we get another dizzy from Boris Johnson, well, let's take him to court. See you in court, Boris. Yeah, he, I don't think Boris Johnson's ever. Got, I think he would love to, but I don't think he's ever. I think he's, he's getting guidance, which I'm sure he will, will. They will prevail upon him, which is not to say no, never say never. Uh, yes. say not not right now. Not right now. Now is not the time. My God, how often have we heard now is not the time? Exactly, and, and, the, and that, because he. You can't say no. You can say, I mean, you can see the way things are moving. Clearly, they're going to have to release the, the data collected by Michael Gove. <laughs> but they're not. They've already buried that again. Um, they, they, they keep burying um, unwelcome pieces of information that they have, and, and especially they, they bury unwelcome polling results. Yeah, but anybody can do polling and come up with the accurate results, and I suspect... If the SNP have got any sense, they will they will have done that because polling is very powerful. It, it can guide you in all sorts of ways uh, that can turn out to be quite helpful. Uh, and so I suspect somebody somewhere will, will be doing that same polling, and I suspect they'll come up with some fairly dramatic results, which I think is what has persuaded the UK government to go down this other route of saying we've abandoned muscular unionism because it just doesn't work. Now we're, is, going to cut, now we're going to cuddle you to death. Yeah. We're going to, yeah, we're going to cuddle you to death. What we're going to do is we're not going to talk about independence at all. Uh, and uh, we're going to deal with the minutiae in the Scottish Parliament. We'll say things like uh, the NHS is crap. Uh, the Scottish government's uh, uh, ministers are incompetent. Uh, uh, they very rarely direct criticism at Nicola Sturgeon because her polling ratings are so astronomically high. The other, the other thing that the other thing that the other reason that I think that this window is closing is because of the Internal Market Act. I mean that was a um, an absolutely um, naked bid to make sure that Holyrood was effectively dismantled or uh, certainly emasculated. And you know if if we if we lie back and take that on top of what Brexit's doing, just then we're mugs. Yeah. Can you see, looking away from Scotland for a second and picking up on a question from Stephen Kelly, that's two questions tonight, Stephen, I hope you appreciate that. He's asking, can you see Plaid Cymru uh, getting some traction in Wales? Uh, well, it's not doing awfully well, and and I suspect one of the reasons it's not doing, I mean, it's, it's making some progress, but it's guy slow. Uh, it's never managed to. Um, uh, Wales is a very interesting place because it's a place where the Welsh language is, is um, you know, regarded uh, with with huge affection and huge pride, and yet that doesn't seem to translate into a huge um, upsurge in, in 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 civic nationalism there. But the other problem that Plaid Cymru has got is that the 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 Labour first minister is actually a good first minister, and I think if Keir Starmer were to ask Mark Drayford what he thought of uh, Boris Johnson he might uh, and what he thought of um uh, or, or of the of the union he might get a very interesting reply he also should ask Mike uh, Mark Drayford how he feels about Brexit because I saw him the other night there and he was absolutely totally critical of the whole Brexit right, and, and, he, and he just made it quite clear and he made it quite clear in terms that I wish more politicians would that the mess we're in is in, in no small measure uh, due to the Brexit decision now he was he was very robust about that and um I I have to say I admire Mark Dray, Mark Brayford I think he's I think he's Drayford. I think he's done a good job as a as a Welsh first minister not least because he's been prepared to make common cause with the uh, SNP and with other devolved administrations and saying to Westminster you know come off it. You see, this will all certainly be used against Stammer at the next general election. The fact that there are Labour members cozying up to Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, and they'll point to him and they'll point to the meetings that he and Sturgeon have had and say, there you are. They've, they're already preparing the way. Uh, I mean, you, I can almost hear the words now, um, a whole bunch of spin doctors working away. I'd like to fit in one last question, if I may, please, Ruth. And you, I, I do appreciate you soldiering on like this. It's great. If the referendum is challenged, Duncan Barron asks, and found to be unlawful by the UK Supreme Court, uh, what, why should people 
in Scotland recognise that judgment? Well, I think because, because I mean, I think we have a, a, a legitimate right to uh, to independence. And I think if we were to lose a, refer a referendum on independence, that is a judgment that the people in Scotland would have to take notice of. I don't, um, I don't necessarily think we would regard a Supreme Court judgment as holy writ, um, not least because the Supreme Court is um, not exactly representative of, of uh, the four nations in, in, in any particular way. Uh, so I'm, I'm not concerned about that particularly. I would certainly, what would cause me um, dismay beyond or beyond anything else is if we fight another independence referendum and lose it, because then, as they say in my hometown, the game's a bogey. Yeah, that would be, and that was the end of uh, separatism in Canada when they lost the, the second okay. referendum by a whisker, by a whisker. Yeah. Ruth, thanks very much. This has been great. Uh, judging by the number of questions, everyone else feels the same. Uh, I've I haven't been able to ask all of them because we've been <laughs> avalanched, but uh, but I thank you most sincerely and, I, and, and a big thank you for soldiering on through your hay fever because anyone who's had hay fever knows how absolutely devastating it can be when it Just afflicts you. You're just stuck with it. <laughs> anyway, um, as I say, I'm about to do something really radical, not, and go and take to drink. Yeah, well, let me just say a, a few words of uh, thank you to you again, and uh, also to uh, tell people about uh, next week's uh, next week's program. Uh, as you know, we have a formidable list of guests on the show, and uh, this is the place for the big hitters. So we're back next week at the same time with eminent philosopher A. C. Grayling. Now, he's with us at 4, 7 p.m. Uh, next week on Wednesday. And you may recall that Professor Grayling was adamantly against independence in 2014. He's now changed his mind. He's now for it. So why has he changed? Well, that's just one of the questions uh, I'll be putting to him next week. If you have questions, uh, and knowing Professor Grayling's background, he'll be more than happy to tackle them. Get your questions in now. Go to the What's On Guide, and there's lots of information there on how to submit your questions. And always, a reminder, look out for Ruth, Ruth Wishart's columns in the National and the Sunday National, and look out for my Constitution column, please, in the Sunday National, when I'll be talking about things that count and things that don't count. And that's the seven-day supplement. And thanks again, and a good night to all of you. Join us next Wednesday. And remember, it's been a great day for British democracy. The Tories have made global Britain, as we discussed with Ruth, the world's greatest laughing stock. So to all of you, thanks for joining us. Stay safe and take care. Good night. Good night. All. Good night.